We're so happy to welcome John Ralston Saul, and we're talking specifically today about the Baldwin LaFontaine lecture. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Maybe you can explain for people what the lecture, what what the purpose is. Well, I'm co-chair of the Institute for Canadian Citizenship with Adrian Clarkson, and we're really about how you know there are all these programs for immigrants, not nearly enough, but lots of stuff. There are no programs to get new Canadians involved as citizens. So that's what the ICC does. And we have three programs, and one of them is this LaFontaine Baldwin lecture. LaFontaine Baldwin, founders of modern Canadian democracy, Baldwin from Toronto, LaFontaine from Montreal. And they were humanists, inclusion, uh, what we would call multiculturalism starts really in a way with them. And so we started this lecture series in 1999. Mm -hmm. And then when we started the ICC, we moved, a group of us who started, moved it over to the ICC. And every year we invite a key person, not just to give a speech, but to give a speech surrounded by conversations. Mm -hmm. And the conversations are to get people involved, to get uh, people who are there. Then we have round tables, we have meals where people talk back and forth. Um, and, it, and, and then you start streaming it out and Twittering it and, and create this national conversation. So this year uh, you had the National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations. Sean Atlio, Shaw and Shud Atlio, yeah. Yep, and so that was the, the focus of the conversation. And I mean, this is a struggle for Canada, and it's been a struggle forever as far as how we treat First Nations people in this country, what they are owed still to this day. What, what conclusions, of any, did you come to? Well, you know, I think the first thing is that really from, let's say, 1600 to 1850 wasn't a struggle. They were actually dominant or equal partners. Well, I'm saying since we yeah. showed up. Like, yeah, well, no, Ish. since we got numerous enough and started breaking the rules. Right. And I think the big thing is that, that it, it, what's tough for Canadians is that on the one hand, there are all the things that were done that are wrong. We just heard about the experimentation on kids, for example. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have to, it's, feeling sorry about it really doesn't get us anywhere. I mean, it's tough, you know, but it makes us feel better about ourselves, but it doesn't get us anywhere. We have to, you know, come to terms with that, be honest and transparent about it. You know, we say with the kids, you know, you know, so what did you do? Tell me what you did, you know. We have to say to ourselves, what did we do? But that doesn't deal with it. What deals with it is um, they're making a big comeback, Aboriginal people. They're on their way to two million. They've won 40 court cases at the Supreme Court. I mean, the Canadian government hasn't won a court case against Aboriginals in 30 years, basically, because mm -hmm. they're right, you know, and our governments have been wrong. And, and what they want is a kind of shift in power and responsibility, and therefore in money, which gives them the ability to play the role they want to play at home, I mean, in their communities, but also nationally. And I think the, the national chief, there are a whole bunch of other Aboriginal leaders there. It's really interesting for Canadians because they always hear about, you know, the problems. We know the problems. But what they forget is 40 years ago, there were uh, virtually no Aboriginals in university. Today, there are 30,000 in university and colleges. The, they were forbidden hiring lawyers until, 40, until 1960. Today, there are over 1,000 Aboriginal lawyers. They didn't want to have lawyers, it's we who forced them to fight this stuff in the courts, so they had to get lawyers. So it's, it's really changing. But I wonder when people you know? say things, see things like Attawapiskat and they feel like, okay, so here you are, you have this land, and it's fantastically mismanaged, and I think that, that people <clears throat> have a struggle between the idea of here is what you deserve and then seeing how it's been managed. Well, let me be completely irresponsible here. Uh, Aboriginals look out there and they see Montreal and his third mayor within a year, completely corrupt and incompetent, Laval without a mayor, and Toronto, let's not even discuss it. Mm -hmm. And they say, gosh, these guys don't know how to run anything. They got terrible corruption in their right. city. Well, so we're not, we, don't we have, have people to be living in third world conditions. Well, but we have to be very careful that we're not simply focusing in on what doesn't work. That's right. Those things don't work. But then I could take you to the Nishka. I could take you to the Haida. I could take you to Nunavut. There are lots of places where you have fantastic leadership and it is working. So what you have to do is always in society is say, this doesn't work. This does work. How do we get the stuff that does work into the dominant position? And that's what people like Shaw. Sean uh, Atlio and you know, Mike de Gagne just named the first ever Aboriginal president of a university in Canada, Nipissing. I mean, uh, these things are happening, and how do we shift that? And, and, and here's the thing which is really tough for, you know, everyone out there who's watching, which is living in Toronto. Um, Aboriginals say, what about the treaties? And people say, oh, what are the treaties? Well, the reason we have this land is because we signed treaties. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we signed contracts. You were just talking about the Russian guy. We signed a contract. It said, we got this, and they get that. And then afterwards, we said, well, we get to keep our stuff, but you don't get your side of it. 
Mm -hmm. So, you know, out west on the prairies, uh, in a public meeting, people very commonly say, it's public rhetoric, they say, who are the treaty people? And the audience of people who are new Canadians, who are in you know, the 19th century, will say, we're the treaty people. They'll call it out. Well, it's true in Toronto. The day that I'm sworn in as a Canadian citizen, I become a treaty person. I inherit the responsibilities and advantages that came with the treaties. And the Aboriginal is saying, look, you know, mm -hmm. this is the basis of our relationship with you, so let's respect the treaties. Mm -hmm. So does the lecture promote this uh, kind of conversation? Do you want it to reach, obviously you must want it to reach a greater amount of people. And then what I'm thinking of as well is that there's a lot of talk of treaties and broken treaties. Yeah. But I, I would think that the Aboriginal people would just want also to be included and less marginalized. Absolutely, but it's a question of how you get included. And part of it comes through respect and respect of the deals that were done. So that's why the treaties are constantly mentioned because that's the kind of framework through which uh, you're involved. And in Toronto, people say, well, what's that got to do with us? Well, there are about 75,000 Aboriginals, I think, minimum living in Toronto, and big cities, so they're, they're mixed in. A lot of leadership of Aboriginals in uh, universities, uh, in schools. I mean, very, very interesting things happening. And I, I think it's... Canadians have to... I feel and uh, this conversation is the way in for most Canadians. They don't know about it. If you're an immigrant, you weren't told about it before you came to Canada. Uh, they, uh, you know one of the most common conversations with new Canadians is they say to me, you know, nobody told us about this. is really interesting, all this stuff about Aboriginal people. Yeah. Why didn't anybody tell us about this? Will you tell us more about it? Mm -hmm. So that's why the ICC wants this conversation going. Well, it's, it's yeah. a long conversation mm -hmm. and a difficult one for a lot of people, but one... But exciting. And one worth having, absolutely. Thank you so much, John Ralston Saul. And we're talking about the Baldwin La Fontaine lecture, which happens now in Stratford for the next few years. Yeah, that, this was the first year in a partnership with the kind of new, rejuvenated Stratford. It great. was really exciting. When you saw the audience, a lot of new Canadians came down for it. That was really fun. Such a great festival. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.